Are we ready to go? All right. We set. <laughs> this meeting is being recorded, everybody. Um, welcome. My name is Fallon Owens, and I am going to be your moderator today for our webinar. Um, welcome to Forest Her NC. I hope everybody's having a, a wonderful day. Um, this today is the third installment of our three-part webinar series about pollinators um, in, in 2023. So we're excited to have you here. Um, hopefully some, if not all of you, have seen the previous two um, of parts of the series um, that are all based on season. So we had a webinar specifically for spring, then we had one about summer pollinators, and today we're going to talk about um, what's relevant about pollinators and conserving pollinators in the fall. So um, we hope that you enjoy. And before we really get started, um, I'm going to kick it over to Bob to talk a little bit about our housekeeping for this meeting. Thank you. So as she indicated, for housekeeping purposes, uh, if you can keep your microphones muted during the presentations, that will help for everybody to hear. Also, we will be using uh, the Q&A feature here in Zoom for questions. So if you have questions of the speakers while they're presenting, uh, please enter your questions into the Q&A feature. If you run into other troubles or something and you need to get a hold of myself uh, as the kind of the background person here, just put it in the chat and I'll try to follow up with you and, and help you to solve whatever problem you might be having. We do have closed caption capabilities. Um, all you got to do is go in and click on closed captioning and it will start for you. Um, and actually, uh, I will make sure that is going. And then uh, last but not least, if you really need to get our attention, feel free to raise your hand and I will respond to the chat uh, trying to see what you need. So with that, I'll turn it back over. All right. Thank you, Bob. Um, so let's talk about what we're going to talk about today. Um, we're going to start out with a brief interactive activity in just a moment where you get to uh, participate and tell us a little bit about your sentiments about your yard or garden during the fall and winter. Um, then we're going to have an amazing uh, presentation about chores in the garden during the fall, especially ones that benefit pollinators. Um, and then we're going to have um, one about the, the plants, the native plants that are beneficial for pollinators that bloom in the fall. Um, then we're going to have another quick activity to wrap up and a long portion for a Q&A session so we can really have a discussion about uh, everything everybody's learned. Um, so oh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now, and I am going to kick it over to um, Barbara Driscoll, who is with New Hope Audubon Society. And uh, I'm really excited to hear her talk because not only is she going to be talking about fall chores that benefit pollinators, but a little bit about the whole ecosystem that pollinators are really part of and the knock-on effects and benefits to other species. So um, Barbara, go ahead and share your screen and uh, we'd love to hear from you. All right. <clears throat> Hi, thank you. Uh, I am with New Hope Audubon, and we have a Leave Your Leaves program. And I'm oh, going to Barbara, Barbara, I'm sorry, I forgot the interactive activity. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I was so excited to hear you you talk. Um, I, I apologize. That is completely um, my my uh, my problem. But I want to hear what people think about their. Um, uh, about their their gardens before you get started. So uh, again, my apologies. I uh, my brain was somewhere else. Um, so for everybody who's participating today, um, I'd love to see if you can uh, give us some input. And um, I think I think Barbara, you can continue sharing your screen. That's fine because the poll should show up. Um, we're going to have a an initial poll question. If Bob can pull it up for us. <laughs> Okay, so hopefully everybody sees um, a rating scale, and uh, if you if you can just interact with this um, and share on a scale of one to ten how important tidiness is to you, especially you or your family in your yard and garden during the fall and into the winter time. So we'll give everybody um, a, 
just just a little bit to to put their input in on how important that tidiness factor is to them. And I see some some input. Um, it looks like there's a lot of variety. Um, most most of the input seems to be um, rated fairly fairly high. We'll give people um, another couple of seconds to to uh, rate that tidiness scale. And uh, okay, I don't see. I, I, a couple people are still pitching in, but uh, I think I think we've given people enough time. So we're going to go ahead and close that. And it looks like most of the uh, most of people have rated tidiness as um, a pretty pretty high, or excuse me, uh, sorry, not at all important. Okay, so the. Um, Oh, I just realized the the scale doesn't show you which one's high priority and which one's not. So we'll say that that one is high priority and ten is low priority. It it does say so. One oh, is not important say. at all, and ten is very important. Okay, ten is very important. Thank you so much. I can't see that on my screen, but it looks like most of people's responses are between one and five. So not not super important. Maybe a little bit but um, not certainly not the, the highest priority for them. And um, that's that's good to hear. That's really interesting because tidiness can be potentially um, a, a, an important factor. Okay, so now we're going to ask another question. It's very, very similar, but but just, just a tiny bit different. Um, if Bob can, oh, Oh, I just lost it. Okay. Um, now we've got one about other people's perceptions. So very similar question. On a scale of one to 10, how much do you rank other people's perceptions of your yard, especially neighbors or, or people in your, your general neighborhood um, when it comes to tidiness in your yard? Give people just a just a little bit more time. All right, I think I think I see everybody's everybody's input is in for the most part. So I'm going to end the poll, and um, it looks like uh, again most most of the responses are saying that it's it's not super important to them. There's there are a few that that say it's it's pretty important. Um, but you, most most people have said it's like of middling importance what other people think, or it's not important at all to them. Okay, and then finally, before we we get back to Barbara and my apologies again, um, we're going to switch to the final another like a last question, and this is about what chores are important to you and that you do every year in your yard to or your garden to get it sort of ready for the winter time. Um, so we've got raking and mulching leaves, uh, removing dead foliage and stems from your garden beds, that's your like planted beds or areas under trees, um, hauling away or burning leaves or dead plant material, and then finally planting new plants. So um, you, can all, you can say you always do that all the way down to you never do that fall chore. People are ranking their chores. I still see some some uh, changes in the poll, so we'll give give people a little bit more time. I think this one's a little bit more complicated because there's multiple questions that you can put input into. This is very interesting. I am so glad we get to ask these questions. <laughs> okay, I. I think most people have participated and I'm not seeing too many changes in the results. I'll give you just, just a couple more seconds if you're still still trying to put it in there. And um, all right, and I think we're ready to end this and look at the results. So it, it looks like there's there's a lot of variety here. Um, some people say they, they pretty much always do all of these, um, but it looks like for raking and mulching leaves, most people say either usually or sometimes. 
um, for removing dead foliage and stems. Again, it looks like most people usually do that um, all the way to rarely, but mostly, you know, sometimes. Um, and then most people do not haul away or burn their leaves and dead plant material. So that's really good to know. Um, but a lot of people said sometimes. Um, and then finally, planting new plants. Um, actually, I'm really happy to see that um, uh, nobody said never and nobody said rarely. So all the responses were either always, usually, or sometimes. So that's, uh, that's a really good lead into Barbara's talk, which thank everybody for your input. And I'm going to actually finally let Barbara present about fall chores. So <laughs> take it away. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna close that out. Um... Hi, um, with New Hope Audubon, and we started a, a Leave Your Lives program in 2020, uh, working with Durham, and uh, we're working with Chapel Hill and Carborough, but it's a good thing for everybody to, to talk about. I know people here are from all over the state, and I also want to talk about other things that you can do in your yard to make it more productive for wildlife. So, let's see something. Okay, so um, in case you're interested, New Hope Audubon is um, uh, the local Audubon chapter. We're in Durham, Orange, and Chatham counties, and we have bird-friendly habitat residential certification program, as well as bird outings twice a week, along with other activities. If you're interested, please go to our website. We have a lot of information on creating a bird-friendly habitat in your yard on our website. So I'm going to talk about leaving your leaves and why this is really an important component in the life cycle of uh, our wildlife and our trees. So in the fall, the trees drop their leaves and, um, and grow new leaves. And, and we're in a deciduous forest here on the west, on the east coast. And so this is what happens every year. And it's been going on for millennia. Um, the leaves are where all the photosynthesis takes place, which means that's where all the energy or a lot of the energy is produced for our plants. And as the days get shorter and the temperatures get colder, it triggers a response in our trees to stop that photosynthesis. And as a result, they release those leaves because they're no longer doing what the, they function for, for the tree, which is producing energies, energy. And then the leaves, they fall to the ground and then they start to decompose. And then in the spring, the cycle starts back up again. So that's sort of the life cycle of our canopy trees, most of our plants that grow here. Um, so that's what's been going on for millennia. And you know, when those leaves uh, fall to the ground, they create their own little mini ecosystem. Um, we have plants and insects that evolve specifically with this in mind. And um, our insects, our native insects, evolved with this flow of spring, summer. Um, so they also tend to go dormant over the winter. So many of the insects are dormant in the winter, just like our trees are. Um, and every, everything evolves kind of with that sequence in mind. And I think if you think of it as you look out your window and you see the leaves falling, you say, everything's slowing down, things are starting to get less active. Um, and, and that's just part of the normal cycle. So the leaves that fall to the ground actually improve our soil and tree health quite a bit. Um, they transition into a different role. And they are broken up by millions of insects that uh, are very tiny and spend their lives in the leaf litter. Um, so ecologists call these creatures detritivores. And they consume dead plant parts of the bacteria and fungi that help break down plant cellulose and fallen leaves. Dozens of species of moth caterpillars are a part of this mix. They eat dead leaves instead of the green ones. Um, of course, these creatures are also eaten by detritivore predators, which number in hundreds of species. So you think about the leaf litter, it's its own little ecosystem. There's billions and billions of little insects and things going on in there, which help improve the soil health. Now, where I live, and one of the reasons I started this program in Chapel Hill, 
is because I see people who have only trees in their yard blowing off every single leaf in the winter into the street to be picked up by the city. And you can see that the soil health of their trees is really terrible. The ground is barren. There's no actual topsoil. So it's very critical to leave this for, if you want health for your, for your canopy trees and for your other trees. The other thing that this is critical for is, which I sort of explained at the beginning, was our insects. <clears throat> some, some of the, you may recognize some of these butterflies and moths. Over 94% of our moths and butterflies overwinter in some form or fashion in our leaf litter. And that is either in chrysalis or cocoons or as larvae. Um, the luna moth, which is one of my favorite moths, overwinters in a cocoon that it forms from leaves. And it's a little uh, larvae inside of a, a round ball of leaves, which is really cool. Um, we have a few butterflies that actually overwinter as butterflies, the learning cloak um, in the leaf litter itself. So it, the leaf litter actually is critically important for us. And you may have noticed over the years that we are losing our butterflies and our moths. We have fewer and fewer of these every year. And I believe one of the reasons is that people are removing their leaf litter from their yard. And so that life cycle, that portion of the life cycle is being emitted, is being lost um, to us. The other thing that is in the leaf litter are uh, fireflies. And who doesn't love fireflies? Well, you're not gonna see them in your yard if you don't have leaf litter. So this is a critical component. They're larvae overwinter in the leaf litter. Um, and it's, it's the home for many, many of our insects. And insects are critical for all of our ecosystems. So uh, we need to feed those insects all year round, not just in the spring, but over the winter also. Um, bumblebees, some of you may have participated in bumblebee counts this year. Um, the queen is the only uh, bumblebee that survives over the winter. And she usually burrows down into a little hole in the ground and the soil under the leaves. So leaving those leaves helps protect our bumblebees. And when she emerges in the spring and starts a new nesting, um, a nest for other bees, then um, she will be stronger because she had that overwintering capability. And of course, uh, as being from Audubon, I'm interested in not only the insects and everything else, but I'm interested in what are the birds eating. And we have birds that exist at all different layers within our canopy. They live at the top of the canopy trees, but we have a lot of birds that um, are on the ground most of the time going through the leaf litter looking for insects. And this is important to help our birds thrive also. And not just our birds, but our chipmunks, our box turtles, other turtles, our salamanders, they also look for food in the leaf litter. And so it's important supporting a lot of our creatures that are on the ground uh, through the winter months. And if it's not there, then they are not getting that nutrition. Another reason that it's important to leave your leaves is for improving water quality. Um, Leaves themselves uh, actually soak up a lot of moisture. Um, leaves allow water to infiltrate the soil, whereas grass and other hard surfaces allows water to run off. Instead of running off bare ground into storm drains, raindrops soak into leaf litter, which is especially beneficial during heavy rains. And we get a lot of those now more than we used to. A layer of leaves can easily absorb downpours of several inches, allowing the water to infiltrate so slowly. So the climate change means more flooding and more drought. A bed of decomposing leaves acts like a sponge, soaking up water during heavy rains. The leaves slowly release water, keeping trees and other plants hydrated during drought and reducing runoff during heavy rains. This means less leaves Leave your less water leaves your yard to flood downstream into our stream rivers and even our drinking water. So, um, and he, around here, a lot of people have been blowing their leaves out into the street and then they get into the gutter. And unfortunately, the leaves that get into the gutter and um, or go through it, get into our water system, 
um, that helps uh, um, or causes for nutrient loading. And in Jordan Lake, I know that the amount of nitrates has increased over time. And part of the problem is because some leaves are getting into the system, they, de they degrade in the water system and then they produce more ni nitrates. So keeping the leaves out of the water system is really important for our water quality um, and the water quality of other people downstream. So I'm sure that everybody loves those noisy leaf blowers out there. And I just wanna say a few words about leaf blowers while I'm talking about this. Um, one of the other benefits if people are leaving their leaves and they're not moving them around or they're raking them uh, is that we won't be hearing so much of the leaf blower noise. And um, the actual leaf blowers uh, produce a, a very loud noise. Um, a cheap or a mid-range leaf blower can expose users up to 112 decibels. And by comparison, uh, a commercial airliner taking off is 105 decibels. So this can cause instant pain and ear in injury where hearing loss is possible in less than five minutes. Um, so some of the people who are actually out there blowing leaves all day are being exposed to extremely loud noise, but you are also, uh, there have been acoustic studies that show that the noise from gas powered leaf blowers is at a lower frequency and therefore it penetrates into your house more. So that's why it's annoying to you because you can actually hear it from further away uh, and over time. So uh, the, le the less you have to hear gas powered leaf, leaf blowers, the better it is for everyone. Um, the leaf blowers also produce a lot of air pollution. And I used to work at the EPA and we did a lot of studies on two stroke engines, which are the dirtiest, most polluting engines that there are, uh, exist right now. Uh, as two stroke engine and a gas leaf blower compared to an average car, uh, one hour of operation of a leaf blower emits about 500 times as many hydrocarbons 49 times as much particulate matter and 26 times as much carbon monoxide as a car. So, you know, they are producing quite a bit more air pollution than anybody else out there. The other thing um, that they are doing is they are uh, blowing up dust, which is uh, particularly bad for people who are asthmatic or the elderly, uh, that, that particulate matter stirred up uh, can include such nasty things as animal feces, pesticides, chemicals, trace quantities of heavy metals such as lead, as well as allergens such as pollen and mold. So um, limiting the amount of leaf blowing going on is better for everybody in the general sense of your health and well-being for you and for your neighbors. Leaving your leaves will also help with climate change. Um, at one point in time, people would bag up their, garb their yard waste, I'm not even gonna call it yard waste, their yard materials and send them to the landfill. Well, most places don't do that anymore, but some places still do. About 8% of the materials that end up in our landfills is actually yard materials. And the reason that's a problematic is that leaves that end up in landfills decompose without oxygen and therefore they create methane. And methane is a potent greenhouse gas that drives climate change. Methane can hold up to 25 times as much heat as carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So it's actually way worse for global warming. Um, and you don't get methane produced when leaves break down in place uh, in your yard. So, you know, there's a lot of reasons to not do anything with your leaves. One is that you can spend more time in a hammock like this guy, maybe with this guy, I don't know. <laughs> uh, no need to pay for leaf pickup. Some cities actually subsidize, like Chapel Hill subsidizes uh, with taxpayer payer dollars picking up leaves. Um, renew, redu reduces the need for fertilizer. Um, you can see that leaves are actually really good for your soil. They build up all those nutrients and all of those algae and things that you need in your soil. It's free mulch to keep the leaves down and, you know, less blowing and raking in the fall. So put your feet up and relax. I'm just 
briefly going over the benefits again. You know, we want to help our pollinators. We want to improve our tree and soil health and our water quality. We want to reduce pollution and help climate change. And then, you know, save yourself time and money as well as city local government's time and money. So what are we going to do with those leaves um, now that they're accumulating in our, in our yard? Well, nothing is the best option or rake them around the base of trees and shrubs, or rake them in perennial borders. Um, you can also compost and use as mulch. Um, and you know, this is really high quality mulch uh, for most gardeners think of it as black gold for the soil. So those are some things that you can do with your leaves. Um, I personally, some people have asked me the question, well, aren't all those leaves just piling up and it's just like this huge mass of leaves in your yard? I never removed the leaves from my yard and it looks basically like this. I mean, the bacteria and everything breaks it down very quickly. You know, there may be some piles at the beginning when all the leaves are falling at the same time, but over the winter that pile gets reduced down to hardly anything and it's absorbed and you, you've got this wonderful soil underneath it that's helping all of your trees. So one thing to think about and I've talked to several school systems and municipalities, parks and rec, you know, instead of having this tight little mulch ring around the base of a tree, you know, extend that out to the drip, drip line. Um, and then this way you're reducing the amount of mowing that you have to do, which is always something that's very costly for municipalities and public schools and for parks and rec. Um, extend the drip line, extend the amount and where you put the leaves so they're not up against the base of the tree. And that's healthier for the tree also, but then you're also not mowing under the tree, which is also good for the tree. So those are some things that you can do with your leaves. I'm gonna change focus a little bit, but this all fits together and talk about how to save the stems. Um, so a lot of people were thinking of our pollinator gardens and we have pollinator gardens put in for pollinators. I like to think of my whole yard as a pollinator garden. Our canopy trees are pretty much host plant for most of our butterflies and moths. Um, think of your whole yard as being a pollinator habitat. And that's why the leaves fit in. But you also, at the end of the season, when you've got those beautiful flowers and they're dying back, you wanna leave the seed heads for the birds. You wanna let the goldfinches have those seeds or you wanna let them drop into the ground. Um, but we also wanna think about our bees. 30% uh, of our native bees are cavity nesters. 70% uh, of them are ground nesters and you wanna have some ground, some soil left aside for them or rock areas for them. But uh, when you're thinking about cleaning up your garden, let's think about not cleaning up our gardens. Let's not do that until early spring. Um, a lot of the bees will lay their eggs in the stems of our plants. Um, and so uh, leaving different types of stems in your garden is very beneficial to our native bees. Um, and we have over 500 species of native bee in North Carolina. So we really want to support those native bees. Here's a picture of what it looks like in a stem where a bee is uh, collected pollen and they've hollowed out this little area inside the middle of the, of the pith of the, the stem and you can see the chambers. So what they do is they will lay an egg and put some nectar and then they will fill in in between each of that then they'll put another egg and more nectar and within each of those a little um, bee will start to be produced over the winter. So this is really helpful for our bees and one thing I learned from um, um, one of the people on the call was that, you know, we want to cut our stems. If you're going to cut and clean up, leave them um, fairly high. But the first winter, um, the bees won't use it, but the next winter they will. So it's important to save those stems. Um, consider maintaining a pile of brush for our bumblebees because we have a number of bumblebees that are not doing well. A lot of our native bees aren't doing well. So we really need to think about habitat for them. Um, for over the winter, for your bumblebees, leave them some areas for, like I said, the queen, she burrows into the ground. 
Um, and then you want to have something that's available for them in the spring when they start to form their nests. So what about thinking about when do we want to cut back? Well, I would leave uh, your grasses and a lot of the dry sea heads over the winter because that just adds winter value, winter interest. Um, and uh, it's, it makes it more interesting for people who come by your house or see your house. Um, normally think about doing some cleanup, wait until March. This is best for our insects. Um, and then when you're cutting back the woody stems, cut them to eight to 24 inches. And that provides these nesting cavities for our bees and some of our other insects also. And when the, the perennial plants start to grow again, then they will cover up and nobody will notice those stems. So, um, you know, and then over time they will degrade and fall apart on their own. So you don't really need to do any more uh, actual activity after that. And we have all kinds, like I said, we have over 500 species of bees. We have bees the size of small gnats. You know, they're a couple of millimeters long, all the way up to our carpenter bee, which is a very large bee. So when you have your winter plants, think about cutting down as you cut the woody stems in the early spring, cut, cut them different types of plants. So different types and, and sizes of woody stems. And there's a lot of information on the North Carolina Extension uh, website about this, but you know, think about this, all of our bees are different sizes. They're gonna need different size stems. So it's good to have a, a diversity of plants and uh, a diversity of things that you cut. So some resources. Um, we have uh, put together a manual on managing native landscapes that's available on our website for download if you're interested in that. Uh, talks about um, when to plant all of this and um, uh, how to plant things. Um, and then also there's a good website on the North Carolina State Extension Agents. Um, they're doing some studies on how and overwintering bees react to having cut these stems. So that's an ongoing research, community research project, which is very interesting. And I assume that's gonna be going on for a few more years. They're just now gathering data. It's been going on for two years, but there's information there that should be of interest to you. <clears throat> Some more resources, Xerces, um, which is an, an insect organization promoting insects uh, conservation and supporting them, especially our bees and other pollinators. Uh, they have worlds of information on their site. Uh, we have some blogs about what to do with fallen leaves and attracting birds. I'd like to thank Triangle Community Foundation for helping us uh, support us in our Leave Your Leaves program. And then Keep Durham Beautiful has some information on composting on their website. If you live within the Orange Chatham Durham area, um, you can pick up one of these lovely signs, leave your leaves here. Uh, we have a pledge on um, leaveyourleaves.org. That is in um, keep, your, keep Beautiful Durham in Durham. And you can go to the local extension agent on Foster Street and pick up a leave your leaves sign. Uh, we've also partnered with the town of Chapel Hill and Carborough, and they have their own signs that are based on our signs that uh, they are giving away if you make a pledge either at Town Hall in Carborough or Town Hall in Chapel Hill, as well as public works departments. So you can pick this up and you can, you know, put these out, advertise them um, for uh, your neighbors to see. I was talking to a friend of mine who does uh, native plant installments in Carbo, and she said for years and years she had been talking to her neighbors about leaving your leaves and why it was important um, for all of our pollinators in our yards. And she said her neighbors would like, no, we're not going to do that. You can have our leaves. And she would take their leaves. And then this last year she put up one of our signs, the, the name. <laughs> went back to the neighbor's house and the neighbor said, no, you can't have my leaves this year. I saw your side and I'm going to leave my leaves. So that was sort of a success story, I think, for leaving the signs out. So letting your neighbors know it's important for um, any number of reasons and having conversations with your neighbors. And that is 
it for me. Stop sharing. Hey, thank you so much, Barbara. Oh man, I was so excited to hear um, about most of what you shared, mostly because I'm I'm already part of the choir. So I was like, yes, yes, leaf blowers are terrible. Um, I hate the noise pollution, but of course the air pollution um, is also a, a huge issue. So thank you for, for kind of delving into that. Um, and of course, talking about all of the benefits to just letting nature do its thing. Um, I think people get really, really worked up about the need to just control everything and keep it neat and tidy. And honestly, there's so many benefits to just kind of stepping back and trusting that nature knows what it's doing. <laughs> right. Well, and it's interesting because I think people are, have in the South, especially have grown up with tidying the garden in the, in the fall, you know, and I was talking to someone on my bird friendly habitat team and she said, Oh, I just never thought about it. My my grandmother did this. She cleaned everything up. She goes, well, now I'm going to leave the leaves. And then she reported back to me the next year because we have so many more birds around our house now that I've left the leaves. And, you know, there's more insects. It's just wonderful. I hadn't thought about it before. But I think changing that habit of thinking now we have to tidy up everything uh, is is a good one. And just thinking this is how nature evolved this is how things evolved in our atmosphere and everything so we need to be um just cognizant of that absolutely absolutely and just the the soil the the, the fact that if you leave the leaves the soil is so much healthier underneath that leaf layer oh man rich beautiful beautiful soil that develops and and it's going to absorb that water the people who blow it off every year it's just barren you can see that everything just rolls up right off of their yards so mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, we've we've got, I think, a little bit of time for some questions for you. We, we will have um, a good chunk of time at the very end of the webinar for a Q&A session. But since we've got some time, um, I, I want to see if anybody has any questions. And regardless of whether they, we get to them now or later, you can at any point put your questions into the Q&A. You should see a button that says Q&A. And um, that way that we know that a question has been asked and we can make sure that it gets addressed versus questions that might get lost in the chat. Um, I do see a couple questions in the chat. So um, with the time that we have before uh, the next presenter, I will um, see if we can answer them. Um, and one person, uh, Caroline Ray asked, are you saying to cut the stems or to allow uh, to allow insects to enter or leave them as is? And Amanda put in some input, but I want to hear your response, Barbara. Um, so I think, you know, I'd wait until like early March, late uh, or April, and then I actually cut the stems because it actually allows the bees to go into the stems and they investigate them. I think some of the research has shown that they don't necessarily use them those the first year, but the second year. But it still allows them the opportunity. And if you don't cut them, then they aren't going to use them. So um, that's why uh, eight to 24 inches up in different heights is very useful for insects. And I can imagine in nature, usually over the winter time, the uh, or, or later into the fall, those dead stems are going to be knocked over and kind of broken um, just just in the environment. But of course, if you need to do something to maintain your yard and, and tidy it up, then you can manually cut them to just enhance that opportunity for bees to get access in there. Right, cutting them. Um, actually, I, everything that I cut, I'd leave it on my property just in case there's some insects in it. So I usually just pile them up in like little uh, brush piles and areas so that they can use that later. Uh, they can access that materials too if they want to. I'm not sure if it's significant if they're standing up or they're laying down. I don't know if that's critical for bees to use them. I think it's just more the access is important. I wonder that would be an interesting thing to to study. <laughs> that, that is part of that stem study. Um, and I think, again, I think it's more about the timing of it. So they found that they um, it's really they're not using them in the fall and the winter of the year they've been growing, they're usually using them in the next year. So the spring, summer, and fall of the next growing season. So your stems of 2023 are going to be the houses of your bees of 2024. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Neat stuff. 
Um, let's see. Uh, Charlene asked, does leaving the leaves apply to pine needles? <laughs> well, you know, our system, we have um, a, a, a pines, a lot of pines in it. Um, and yeah, I would say leave your pines, uh, pine needles too. Um, those are part of the ecosystem, pine trees. I leave them in my yard. Mm -hmm. There's different different plants and different insects that benefit from pine needles and, and the, right. the acidity that they bring to the soil, right? Yeah, and I think for some people who are worried about the neatness factor of leaving your leaves and having them blow here or blow there, sometimes putting a small layer of mulch around the edge mm -hmm. uh, keeps those leaves from blowing away. And I think that makes it look also more intentional because a lot of people, you need the cues for care. So your neighbors are thinking, well, they haven't just let everything go. So it's like leaving a small strip of grass, which I'm not a big grass component. Fan, but I'm just saying you leave a small strip of grass or putting some mulch around the edge of it makes it look very intentional. I'm doing this on purpose. This is not just some kind of random thing. If you're worried about what your neighbors think. Yep, absolutely. And those signs kind of fit in that too, right? There's a sign saying, I'm doing this on purpose. I'm not being lazy. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll add one thing to the pine needles though. Um, so I find a lot of people, if you go you do have to clean pine needles out of shrubs and trees though especially for people who have planted things underneath their pine trees pine needles have a tendency to build up within the crowns of those trees and if you let that happen over time too long it will cause decline in the trees so even though you can leave them on the ground please take them out of your trees and shrubs underneath your 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 pine trees because that it does it does hinder the growth of those plants um, most plants are not used to um, things staying in their canopies and that's the unfortunate downside of, of pine needles is they kind of kind of lodge themselves on on um, branches whereas most of our large deciduous leaves tend to either break down or just don't lodge themselves within trees Oh, right on. That's an interesting point. Thank you, Amanda. And speaking of your uh, your advice on on pine trees and ge your general input, um, even though we're a little bit ahead of schedule, I want to give you plenty of time to share what you are going to share today with everybody about um, uh, fall fall blooming plants and their their uh, benefits for pollinators. So, um, Amanda, I'm going to introduce you, and and you're with the uh, the North Carolina um, State Extension with Cooperative Extension, and um, I'll just I'll just let you go ahead and and uh, take take the uh, the stage here. <laughs> okay, I was um, uh, Barbara, you made a you use like the the buzzword of the day cues to care is is that's the word um and i was hoping <laughs> i was trying to find a picture i needed to take a picture of it um i was cleaning up at the pollinator haven garden here in lee county and um and i, I can't now that i know all these things about pollinators i just can't throw anything away and um and um but i do have to be very mindful of how i'm letting seeds fall in our garden because it's such a small garden um, and so I try and leave them as, as long as I can, but I will cut them to, um, to keep the seeds from dropping directly in the garden. So I created a little like bundles of, of flowering seed heads around a couple of our trees <laughs> and our general services in Lee County probably thinks I'm crazy, but, um, it looks kind of interesting. Um, as, as the, as the fall goes around, I think it'll, um, it'll kind of fluff down, but right now it looks a little fluffy. But anyways, okay, so um, I am going to be talking today about fall blooming native plants for pollinators. I know this is, you know, I'm, I'm kind of among friends and among people who who love presentations like this. This is going to be one of those. And look at this pretty picture and look at this pretty picture. Um, I will say that a lot of my slides have a lot of text on them. Um, and I can send a PDF version of this presentation out. And I know there are some people on here who might even take pictures of these slides, but I wanted to make sure that even if I don't, I'm not able to talk about all the finer points of these plants, you do at least have some of the um, characteristics of these plants. So um, this is a picture here of a bouquet I made of flowers out of our um, pollinator haven garden. 
So I am with Cooperative Extension, and if you do not know with co what Cooperative Extension is, uh, you you hopefully will by the end of this presentation, and you should definitely go introduce yourself to your local Cooperative Extension office if you have any um, love or desire of plants. We love hearing from our plant friends and people who are passionate about them. Um, and our mission is to really extend research-based knowledge to all North Carolinians. Um, and I love that element because, uh, you know, I'm not just some crazy person on YouTube who makes pretty videos. Um, and we are also the folks who um, oversee the Extension Master Gardener program. And that is the essentially the, the service volunteer arm of Extension. And so folks who are Master Gardener volunteers um, are there to support horticulture agents to connect people to horticulture through science-based education and outreach. Um, so we're all here to help you reach your plant goals, which is very cool, I think. And um, this is the Pollinator Haven Garden. Uh, and there's a little bit more behind me, I think. Um, if you've heard, you, most of y'all probably have heard of Debbie Roos. Um, when I started with Extension a little over a year ago now, and um, uh, <laughs> Debbie's, uh, pollinator, um, uh, Chatham Mills pollinator garden. I, I'm bringing the, that energy to our extension office in Lee County and slowly taking over parking lot islands around our building, uh, much to the chagrin of my boss, but I think he'll be okay. <laughs> so this is the um, parking lot island that greets you. This is what it looks like today. Um, and I'll show you a little bit more about that project and why it looks so different. So I love that Barbara went into a little bit of the details about fall, but I did want to cover a few more things. Um, when they said, you know, fall flowering um, native plants, it's like, well, what do you mean by that? Um, is it is August fall? Is September fall? When is that? Um, well, officially it's the 21st of September, but really in my in my gardening brain, I always think September 1st is kind of fall. Um, the light changes just enough that your, your body recognizes, hey, the seasons are changing. And in North Carolina, we have such kind of, we have a very mild climate these days. So November 30th can still have some pretty strong fall vibes if we haven't uh, had a really hard frost. Um, from a practical standpoint, um, fall is that transition between summer and winter. And our days are getting shorter, our nights are getting longer. and what really helps our plants is is because the the earth is on a uh, axis tilt by about 23 and a half degrees i think um it that is actually what causes our seasons and this is very important to the survival of all of the life that's on the earth because it has evolved and grown with this this tilt um but the angle and the wavelength of sunlight changes so you can see this little graphic here um so the june sun rays are um, they they hit a much smaller area, so they are much hotter. They have a lot more energy, whereas the December rays are coming at such a long angle that they hit a larger area, so the energy is dispersed. So even in December, we can stand in the sunlight and still feel the warmth, but it's not like standing in the sun, sunshine in June and July. Our temperatures are getting cooler, and that temperature differential is the other key point. Um, the, the difference between uh, day and night temperatures, plants can sense that and they can sense the uh, ratio of those things. Um, the chemistry and the physics of it is, is pretty interesting. And, um, and then of course, the frost is coming. <laughs> uh, we, I think there was a frost um, alert on Monday night. We did not get one here in, at the extension office, but I know about three miles away further west we did. So, you know, it is coming. So why is fall important for pollinators? So this is kind of pollinators last time to, oh crap, um, to get it all done. You know, insects especially, um, and, and animal and um, vertebrates as well, but they are, unlike us, they can't put coats on, they can't go inside and warm themselves up, they can't turn a heater on. Um, so their bodies are really attuned to those, those temperatures and they will go into a period of dormancy. And so they are trying to get, they're trying to find shelter, they're trying to finish and get to that next life stage that's gonna help them get through the winter. They're trying to find food either for their offspring and then they're going to die. 
um, or they are trying to find food and build up stores so they can make it through the winter. So this is a very critical time for a lot of pollinators um, because this is kind of the, the, the beginning of the end for them. Now, uh, we're talking about plants that you can plant, but I do want to remind folks that that habitat loss and fragmentation are everyone's problem, and, and all of us have a part to play to help pollinators and, and other um, animals, because what we put in our landscapes, how we manage our landscapes, and how we hold our elected officials um, accountable for managing our landscapes is our problem, and, and we've really created a system where our habitats are highly fragmented and we have favored these traditional quote unquote traditional landscapes that um, Barbara spent a lot of time kind of uh, uh, de, uh, um, looking through and kind of critiquing and, and saying how we can change some things because really a lawn and um, cookie cutter landscapes are really not supporting healthy ecosystems and you can do something by planting, intentionally planting things, taking certain things out, changing your um, management habitats. Now, I am not advocating that everyone's landscape needs to look like this picture. This is a lot of work. Um, this is probably a lot of money if you don't know people who are willing to give you um, plant divisions. Um, and, uh, you know, so I, I, I do respect that everyone can aim themselves towards this goal at whatever they feel comfortable and capable of doing. Um, but really the key is just making sure that you increase the number of plant species in your yard and cluster the same things together um, because that is really kind of emulating what nature used to look like before we have done all the things we've done to it. Um, now, I am focusing on native um, plants in this presentation. I do want to say a little bit about non-natives. So there isn't definitive research that say that native plants are better than non-native plants, but I think we all kind of inherently know and feel this because there are a higher diversity of native plants kind of in, in the whole grand scheme of our landscapes. They are there present, but I, we have lantana in our garden here. There are still people who swear by it as a pollinator plant. Um, I always try and tell folks to favor natives over non-natives. And I don't lump non-natives with invasives. And invasive species have a very specific legal definition. And I have a zero tolerance policy for anything that even sniffs of becoming that isn't native and that could potentially escape cultivation. I, I don't want to clean up after horticultural messes. Um, again, the really key thing is that diversity is what's important. And many of our um, native plants um, serve as host plants for our native pollinators. But in the case of this bottom right or bottom left hand picture, these are gardenia leaves, and um, a butter a caterpillar had crawled in and made a its pupa in the gardenia leaves because it was the the closest shrub to where it was trying to pupate. So, you know, sometimes it's just what you what you got on hand. Um, I. I didn't, I, before I prompted this picture because some people have opinions on blue mist flower as to whether or not it's native. I think the non-native and the native species have hybridized with each other. So I'm not too terribly worried about it. Um, in the grand scheme of things, it hasn't really taken over and done anything scary, crazy in our landscapes. Um, and it is a very good pollinator plant. Um, and this is a native praying mantis um, looking for prey on it. Um, for those of y'all who are, you know, fav uh, favor certain pollinators over others, um, we've select, we as humans, we kind of know that there are certain plants that certain pollinators prefer, but scientists have a name for this. It's called pollinator syndromes. And this is just the, the flower characteristics and traits that may appeal to a particular type of pollinator. Um, and all of the, the color, the nectar guides, the odor, nectar, pollen, and flower shape, all of those have very specific shapes because of the type of pollinator that insects are trying to, that flowers are trying to attract certain insects and animals to it. So if you want a lot of, um, let's say hummingbirds, you'll want to plant a lot of um, tubular flowers that are red, orange, or some sort of bright color. Um, 
So just kind of thinking about what kind of pollinators you might want to attract, you can use this chart and it's available at pollinator.org. Still, it's pretty cool. Um, so this is a silphium, uh, which has um, very broad flowers, easier for large butterflies to land on as well as small beetles. And we were talking about stems. This time of year, I noticed I have been cutting stuff for, for cut flowers and harvesting seeds. And the green link spiders have just been out in force using a lot of these places. And you can kind of see these ladies here um, kind of have really done a good job of selecting where they're laying their eggs. Um, they blend in really well <laughs> with their habitats. So just another kind of um, animal to look out for. Yes, they do eat pollinators. That is the circle of life. So we're going to dig into our plants. Um, so as a little blue stem, some people, especially if you come from an agricultural background, when I first planted this in our landscape at um, the Pollinator Haven Garden, um, an old uh, one of a, one of the original um, farmers from the county, he's like, "Why are you planting that? That is such a weed." And it is kind of it is kind of weedy if you let the seeds fall, but man, I love the fall color of the little blue stems. Look at this! Like I did not do anything to this photo. It is literally the entire spectrum of all the colors. There is everything from yellow to purple on this plant, um, and there are some really cool hybrids or not hybrids selections of little blue stem. I have seen pure white. Like there's so much. Um, they're so glaucous that they almost look white. Just really, really great plant, um, especially in the fall as they start changing colors. Ooh, and I realized I did not update the um, uh, cultural information on that, so I'll change that. Another grass that's really great is muley, muley grass. Um, this is a really actually kind of, uh, you can use it as a shrub alternative if you're not really particularly interested in shrubs. And um, Barbara mentioned that uh, bunch grasses are great for overwintering um, bumblebees. This is great bumblebee habitat. Um, and I've seen, I've seen bumblebees, I've seen small animals, um, other insects use the clusters of these plants to protect themselves. And this is kind of what it looks like. You can see the fog in the background. Um, when we have those late fall uh, fogs, all of the little dew drops that fall on the foliage and the flowers, it's just really magical. You can't beat it. Um, I do leave this foliage um, up and this is kind of what it looks like in the dead of winter. This is a picture that I took in um, January of, of Muhlenbergia. So you can see it still kind of has a, um, it still kind of has some, some um, structure to it. Um, but like Barbara said, a lot of these things start kind of falling apart. And so it makes for a really easy cleanup if we just give it some time to sit over the winter time and let it be habitat for our animals. One shrub I wanted to mention, this is a picture I took at Weymouth Woods um, of the Calicarpa Americana, the beautyberry they had out there. And I just love, 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 love the fall color of beautyberries because the, the, the foliage turns yellow, the berries are that bright magenta electric purple. You just can't even make up that color, it's ridiculous. Um, and the berries even in some cases will hang on even after the, the foliage falls off. So you're just left with these long strings of clusters of purple berries. Um, if you have cedar wax wings or mockingbirds or um, cardinals in your yard, they love this plant. This is a great bird plant. Um, and if you really get if you really get um, uh, desperate, you can eat them as well. I know people who make beauty berry jelly. Um, they, it kind of has a um, an herby type of flavor, so you know don't expect it to be super sweet. It's kind of herby. This is in my top three plants this year for sure. This is one I've never grown before, but Salvia azuria is an incredible salvia. If you don't have this in your salvia collection and you're one of those salvia people and you know who you are, this is one to get in your garden next year. Um, this was, of all the plants that we had um, besides some of the larger sunflowers, I saw the highest diversity of bees 
on this than any any other plant except for our Minarda fistulosa. Like we had some really, we had a couple of rare species of bumblebees that were only, only visiting this flower. Um, and it's got a really, it flowers its head off from, I think ours was flowering from early July all the way until now. <laughs> um, this color is real. Like it stands out in the, the landscape, like you wouldn't believe. Um, and I've got a picture. This is, oh no, where did it go? I've got a picture somewhere. I think I moved a slide and, and uh, lost it, but we'll, we'll see, you'll know it when you see it. <laughs> uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the mountain mints and the mountain mint that I have in, in this photo, this is um, Pycnanthemum virginicum, um, the Virginia mountain mint. It's a, not as aggressive as some of the other mountain mints and it's a little more of a tight clumping one. Um, if you're, if you have a lot of space for um, something to run, um, Pycnanthemum muticum, Pycnanthemum albescens, those are two great ones that you can just let run wild and free and just mow it down when you're not, when you don't want to see it anymore. Um, but this is a really nice one. I love the color of the foliage too. It has a much denser kind of olive green um, foliage color. And again, just like those little bees and the bumblebees, this is their, one of their favorites. I've got a couple of weird plants in here. Um, and these are things that I have been, um, I, I do stop on the sides of the road and botanize. I botanize at 60 miles an hour um, when I'm driving by. Um, and I do walk down the side of the road just to check things out. And this is one that um, I had never seen before. I thought it was a mountain mint. I took it home and keyed it out and turns out it's this really weird, really weird genus called Hyptus. Um, and this is a species called Hyptus alata. Um, it might be another species, but the botanists are out on it. But I love how it is done in the landscape. Um, it's kind of, it is closely related to the mountain mints, but it has this much more upright vase shape. And the foliage is kind of this dark, dark, bright green, if you can imagine what that means. Um, but when you see it contrasting with these flower heads, it really is outstanding. Um, and the bumblebees have loved this. This is one that um, is I'm planted in one of our parking lot islands. And, um, and when I come in in the morning, this is where the bumblebees like to sleep. Um, there's always yeah. that one plant that they like to sleep in. <laughs> uh, Roadside weeds, I do want to give them a shout out. Um, partridge pea, if you have some space for this in your garden, if you've got this on your roadsides, please don't mow it down. It's um, really important for um, our sulfur butterflies, really important for our sulfur butterflies, but it has a really long bloom time. It will bloom. I've seen some blooming as early as May and June. I have some, the, this, these plants, I took these pictures yesterday. Um, that they're still flowering and putting seeds on. So really wide um, bloom time, tough as nails. It will grow through any drought that you can give it. Um, really great plant. Uh, passion flowers. <laughs> Some of y'all may might be out there going, no way, Jose. Um, but if you give this a spot in your yard or on your property, I find this a lot in forest edges. Um, but in the garden, we have um, I knew that we had gulf fritillaries and some other fritillary relatives. And so thankfully the caterpillars do a really good job of keeping this vine in check and it's easy to pull up. So when it gets too aggressive or overtake something, I just rip it out and throw the, the vine in our brush pile. Another weird weed that you might see, um, this is kind of like a tidy Joe pie weed is what I would describe it as. Um, and it has added a really interesting texture to our garden. It's, it's really not commonly in cultivation, the camphor weed, Pulchea. Um, but if you see this, it is native um, and it has a really interesting texture. And I've not seen a lot of large pollinators on this, but a lot of very tiny, tiny bees and flies. Um, that really seems to be the niche that it's filling, which has been very interesting to see in the garden. So we're going to really delve into our fall asters and I, um, I hang on, buckle up your seatbelts because asters are the 
the stars of the show in the fall and we have to go over them. Uh, Coreopsis palustris. This is uh, Summer Sunshine is a selection by Juniper Level Botanic Garden in South Wake County. And I kid you not, this is, it's just solid flowers for a month and a half in September. I mean, you cannot beat these, <laughs> this flower show. Um, the finches will come afterwards and clean it out. This is a very, very aggressive Coreopsis. Um, but if you can give it a corner of your yard, it will fill it and it grows in full sun to part shade. Happy as Larry, and you cannot beat that September show. Like, I mean, just, I just, I love looking at that picture. Um, Brown-eyed Susans, oh, my, my photo got a little messed up. Um, not to, well, Brown-eyed Susan, Black-eyed Susan, it's all common names, whatever you want to call them. Um, I like the brown, I like the red Vecchia triloba though, because the flowers are really small and they tend to be very popular with our small bees. Um, a lot of our um, uh, sweat bees and things, you, you can usually pick them out, not because you can see their body, but you can see their pollen baskets full of all those all that yellow pollen, which is really great. Um, and the birds have now found our seed heads in the garden. And I, this is one of the ones I had to cut back because this will volunteer everywhere and it will volunteer everywhere next year because I totally missed the season for cutting them back. Um, but hopefully the pollinators will be able to see, find the stems where I put them because uh, deadheading this and leaving some stems would have been nearly impossible. <laughs> um, and I do love um, blue and yellow. You'll see a lot of blue and yellow in this presentation. This was a, this was a um, black eyed Susan I have never grown before this year. Um, uh, unfortunately, we had a bit of a run-in with some herbicide uh, earlier this year, and unfortunately, a rare echinacea I had growing um, was hit with some herbicide, um, and so uh, I got some money to buy this um, other rare plant called sweet cone flower. Um, I got this from Rachel's plant, native plants in Pittsburgh, and I could have sworn if you see this growing, you would think that you were growing an echinacea until the flowers come out. And then you're like, okay, that's clearly not an echinacea, but otherwise you would totally think you're growing an echinacea. And I, I have a, I love these long strap like petals. Um, it really just looked very elegant in some strange plant like way. Um, so we, we move these, but where we put them, they're really going to be able to fill in. I'm very excited about where we've moved them to. Um, we have to talk about the golden rods because everyone should have goldenrod in their garden. Now, you need to have the right goldenrod. Um, I'm not telling everyone to go out and dig some goldenrod off the side of the road. Um, there are some clumping goldenrods that are great for gardens, and I highly recommend um, looking for a clumping or a slow spreading goldenrod, but these will extend your bloom, your fall bloom season well into, and sometimes even past frost. Some of these will continue to bloom after frost and the pollen and the nectar resources that a lot of these species have are very valuable to our um, late season pollinators. You'll see, you know, dozens and dozens of species on these. And here's, I just, I really fell in love. This was um, Solidago sempervirens that we added to the garden last year. I just love, love the habit. It almost looked like a shrub, just the way it kind of splayed out. Um, the rosin weeds, the silphiums, I'm a huge fan. Uh, I, I put, uh, we have uh, three species of, of silphiums in the garden. I just love the habit of them. Some of them are seed grown and they look completely different, um, but they make these really great, you know, sunflower like flowers and just so many of them. Um, and the big swallowtail butterflies love them. The bees love them. Um, uh, flower beetles love them. Uh, and they have such a long bloom period. They put on flowers for two months um, and just have a really great texture. And uh, the starry rosin weed is one where most of the year is just like a little circle of leaves. But when the flower spike comes up, I have it planted so it kind of comes up in between a few things. And it's just like this pop of color um, between different textures. Here's a little bumblebee sleeping on one of them. Oh, here. Here's my, my uh, um, salvia picture. This is salvia and 
the other um, rosin weed here, which just love that combo. Uh, the So we're going into the Sympatricians. This is for, for those of y'all, this is the asters, the true asters. Um, the botanist got a hold of them and now they call them Sympatricians. So um, let's all practice our Latin together. Uh, this is one called Great Crush, and it's selected for its kind of tight clumping um, habit, but this was a seed-grown one that I bought from a local native plant nursery called Dutch Buffalo Farm, and the, the nursery owner there buy it, gets his seeds off the side of the road. He does have collection permits for his seeds, so don't go off on other people's property without proper permission. Um, but the difference kind of with the, the New England asters is that this is a much tidier um, sturdier aster than most of the other ones. It's, it's, it has very strong stems, um, and while the other ones kind of are lackadaisical, if you will, uh, like this one. <laughs> uh, I will say aster or Sympatricium eliotii um, will flower after frost, and I have seen it flowering at Christmas. Um, it doesn't really open its flowers until the beginning to middle of November and it will sail past frost. It's it's a really great one. Kind of hard to get a hold of these days, um, but if you have somebody, if you know somebody who knows somebody who has some, uh, you only need one piece, <laughs> and then you will have it forever. Um, the calico aster, this is another one that I just grew for the first time this year. Um, I am in love with this plant. Um, everyone should have these because I love even though it, it grows from a basil rosette, when the flowers come out, they kind of lay over and make it look like a shrub. Um, and again, the flowers, they smell sweet in the sunshine and little tiny bees and butterflies, the little uh, skipper butterflies love these. Um, and this is the beginning of the aster flowering season. They kind of flower the earliest of the smaller flower asters. So you know the fall is really coming when you see these guys opening up. Uh, Symphotrichium grandiflora. You guys probably are seeing this on the side of the road right now. This was a selection at Juniper Level Botanic Garden that I absolutely loved. It flowers, just makes a really nice flowering mound while some of the other wild types don't quite mound and flower as floriferously as that one. Um, so this was my, this was my garden. Um, I have a orchard. This is my IPM orchard is what I call it, my degraded pest and pollinator management orchard. Um, so all my fruit trees are surrounded by these um, mints and sunflowers and things. Um, so this was October 1st. This was yesterday. Um, and it can be, it's a very dramatic change. I, I love coming, driving home because this is what I drive up to. Um, so this is Sympatrichium. The purple stuff is the Oblongifolium grandiflorum, not quite sure, they might be a hybrid. And then um, the white is Ericoides racemosum, again, might be a hybrid. It popped up. Um, you probably have seen um, the Oblongifolium before. Um, that is one that is commonly in the nurseries these this time of year. And if you're trying to look for a chrysanthemum native alternative, this is the one that they usually sell. Um, so the, uh, they call it, this one is called October Skies because you can almost set your calendar to it. The first week of October, it will be flowering usually. Um, and it has a lighter color than some of the other ones, um, but still anything in the oblongifolium group is very good. Um, uh, when I told people that I was uh, growing these in my garden, <laughs> they thought I'm, they think I'm crazy. These were volunteers because they are true roadside weeds, but I could not deny that flower show. It really, these shrubs hum. I, I had a video that I took out because we just didn't have time for it. And I know I'm, I am to time now, but um, it, it really does hum and all like everything finds this because it's flowering now. It's so late in the year. And I love the smell. If you've ever smelled, it smells like chamomile. It's very closely related to chamomile, but it smells like chamomile. Um, and it's just such a sweet, honey-like scent. Uh, it is a weed though. So I have to be very mindful. I'm letting this stay here, but once the, most of the flowers fade, I will be cutting this back and leaving some stems, but I'm going to get rid of all of the flowers because I do not want any seeds dropping in my garden. Because if you let this stay, this is all you will have. 
and I don't in the place that I have this growing I have other things planted there so I just have to do that extra maintenance for myself to let this stay where it is because it's just so beautiful <laughs> um so I've been talking a lot about roadsides and many of y'all own property and um have property that's uh, near roadsides. So you can be a steward of your roadsides. Please do. We do not respect our roadsides as much as we should. This was uh, actually a picture I took in Apex at a gas station. Some of y'all probably have driven by this gas station. But when I was driving into the gas station to get gas, I noticed there were five species of, of golden rods kicking around that gas station. Um, and you could tell where they had been mowing and where they hadn't been mowing um, and where they hadn't been mowing, all these, these plants were growing and it was wonderful. So um, you can still reduce your mo your roadside mowing. Um, you can put up signs to ask uh, DOT folks and contractors. Most of the mowing on some of the roads is done by contractors and not actual DOT folks. So you can put signs up to, to communicate with them. And if you have power lines on your cuts, power line cuts on your property, you can talk to the power company about how that can, that is maintained. Um, especially there's some really great research that's been going on um, to restore prairies um, and grasslands underneath power line cuts. So um, there, there are resources out there to help you do that if it's on your property and talk to your neighbors. Um, you know, if you can just mow one to two to up to three times a year, you'd be amazed at what happens and what can pop up. So a couple of things, I know I'm 32 minutes, so a few final thoughts. Um, fall and winter are kind of the best times to work in the temperate garden and work because we just got finished talking about all the stuff that you don't have to do. Um, but the big thing that you can do and that you should be doing this time of year is moving your perennials in your trees. Um, most of our, our temperate, um, climate plants, this is a great time to move them because they are going dormant. They're going to be putting on root growth this time of year. Um, they're going to have enough time to get their roots in the ground and establish before they have to go through our brutal, our brutal um, summers. So um, if you got some things that you've been annoyed with this year, move them and plant them now. That being said, when you are digging, be mindful. There are turtles and frogs and bees that have probably potentially burrowed in the ground. So when you're digging, if you see something move, just be gentle, pick it up, dig a hole, plant it back. Whatever animal it is will greatly appreciate you doing that. Um, so we did some, uh, so this parking lot island um, that you can see these ladies wrestling with, um, we that was planted almost a year ago from this picture. It was completely barren, it was a moonscape. Um, so all those plants and all that growth that you see is less than a year from a four inch plant. And, uh, and at this point, after even just one year, we know there was a lot of growth that had happened. Things didn't do what we wanted them to do. It wasn't quite the look I was going for. It's a little too wild and crazy. Some things got a lot bigger than I thought they were. Um, so we did a work day and a workshop about um, perennial division. And we even had some kiddos come out and help. And we moved some stuff around, replanted some stuff, took some stuff out, cut back some stems, made some plant or some, made some stem bundles. We had a great time. And so we started with this. And then, um, so this was the day before that workshop. And this was the day, this was what it looked like after the workshop. Um, and I'm very excited to see what it will look like next year. Uh, we did talk about, um, uh, you know, leaving your leaves, but don't feel the necessity to always cover all bare ground. We have been teaching that a lot um, in our horticulture classes, but it is important to leave bare areas for our ground nesting bees. So um, even if you are leaving some leaves, maybe in areas where you know things just aren't growing, everybody has a bare spot. Sometimes that bare spot is meant to be a bare spot. And don't be afraid to rake some leaves off of that. So that way we leave some blank spots for our ground nesting bees. When you're sourcing plants, <laughs> when you're sourcing plants, for the love of goodness, please know where you're getting them from. Um, the internet is full of crazy, amazing things. Don't trust everything you read on the internet. 
Don't believe all the beautiful pictures that you see on the internet. Um, it can be very dangerous. So if you are getting something off the internet, please research the nursery. We've got some great, amazing garden centers and nurseries in North Carolina. So you can stay local, which is what we love. Um, always inspect your plants for pests and diseases. Don't, don't take a plant home that's got a pest or disease. Um, it, start with good plants. Um, and just and also know the plant before you buy it. <laughs> I will say I'm guilty of just going to the garden center and going, oh, that's pretty. I'll take that home and see what happens. Um, but sometimes it can be more work than it's worth. And, and you know, then you have to call the extension office and talk to the horticulturists and explain to them why you bought this random plant that you didn't know about. Um, three more slides. This one um, is for farmers and I will uh, copy this link into the chat. If you own a farm or, a, or manage a farm property and somebody else farms for you, um, we are looking, this is a farmer survey about, um, we're trying to assess interest in installing ecologically beneficial habitat on farms. So even if you are not actively farming, if you rent your land to farmers, we wanna hear from you. This, this, the survey is for, for you because um, the research right now and the guidance right now has not been focused on Southeastern um, farmers. And so we wanna hear what your experiences and what your needs are. Um, I am the state coordinator for the Great Southeast Pollinator Census and many of y'all may have done that this year. Um, thank you for participating. Um, there is a webinar that we did um, with um, the Natural Science Museum a couple of weeks ago that talked about some of the um, uh, results from that, but set your calendars for next year, uh, August 23rd and 24th, that's a Friday and a Saturday. We look to see you there and we will have plenty of information about that before next year. And then that's all I've got. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody, for listening to me go on about all my, all my plant loves. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much, Amanda. Oh man, as a, um, as a plant nerd myself, I, I loved hearing about um, new species in different genera that I'm very familiar with, um, like the, uh, the Symphiotrichums and the Solidagos, the Goldenrods, um, but there's so many different species and no matter who you are, there's always a new species to learn even within a familiar um, genus. Uh, and that diversity is super key, right? Yeah. That you, you got to have diversity is the spice of life. It really, it really is. And having, um, I didn't really drill it home, but when you're doing, um, even though if you have a wide variety of plants, it's good to group them together and have them in large masses because plant uh, uh, insects have a hard time finding one plant among many. But if you have them all grouped together, they can really see those a lot better. Mm -hmm. and, and tying into what Barbara was talking about about making things look intentional in your yard so that your neighbors don't think you're just letting everything just go and do its own thing. Planting in clumps really helps the neighbors know that you did this on purpose. <laughs> yeah, that, that picture I showed of my IPM, IPPM orchard, um, that, that building that was in the background, our house is on the other side of that. So I can't see the whole orchard, but our neighbors can. And when I first planted that, the the late the the lady of the home that our one of our county commissioners lives in that home and his wife came out and she was like so what are you doing here <laughs> and I had to explain to her because when I planted them last year there were no flowers on them I had cut them back for planting and I said just 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 trust me just wait I promise it's going to be amazing you're going to love it and she came out last week and she said I get it now I see I see what you were going for and I'm like uh, so, so much about dealing with plants is about patience. Um, so, so now we, um, we're going to take just, just a teeny bit of time. Thank you, Amanda. Um, and do uh, another couple of poll questions before we wrap up for the webinar. And then after that, there's going to be a Q&A. So I see some people have put some questions in. We're going to get to those. Um, but before that, let's, um, let's see what you guys think now about, um, uh, about your your fall chores to see if there's any changes. So um, we've got another poll question that uh, all right, Bob has just pulled up. So so this is pretty much the uh, the same question that we had earlier on in the webinar asking about um, 
which chores you prioritize in your garden or your yard in in the fall to prepare for winter time. And so, um, you know, rank those according to, uh, you know, how how often you do them. And let's see if we can figure out if anybody's um, fall chore priorities have changed at all. <laughs> It'll give you a, um, a little bit of time and just think about, I don't know, whether whether anything has changed for you. <laughs> Hopefully. Hopefully. And that looks like people are still still putting their input in. And remember, there's there's no incorrect answers. No, <laughs> what you do in your own yard is your business. <laughs> All right, just a couple couple more seconds, I think, and then we'll end the poll and see uh, see what the results are. All right, Let, let's Ooh. see here. So, um, can everybody see that, Amanda? Can you see the? the yeah, results? I can see the results. Yeah. Okay. We I, we've got some change. Yeah, let's see. We've got planting new plants. I think there's there's more more people at the bottom there. The last option, uh, more people that said that they um, are probably going to do some fall planting. Yeah. Um, which is very exciting. It's I think it's something people forget about because when you're when you're um, farming for crops for um, vegetable gardening, of mm -hmm. course, you're going to be doing it in the growing season. But for perennials and native plants, fall is is the sweet spot, the good time. So yeah. um, raking and mulching, I see probably a little bit, a little bit more um, proportion, proportionally people saying they are rarely or never going to, um, to uh, rake or mulch their leaves, which which is great. And again, you can, you can do whatever you want to in your property. And, and, you know, your, your property might have different priorities depending on whether it's really close to the house or, you know, in, in the part of the yard that you want to maintain as a lawn. Um, so removing dead foliage and stems from the garden beds, I see um, a, a lot of people saying sometimes, but a lot more people saying that they are rarely or never going to remove the dead foliage, which is fantastic. Um, one, it's less work for you. Two, really, really beneficial for all that wildlife that um, you you want to be able to provide habitat for. And then I think I'm trying to remember what the response was before, but on the question of hauling away or burning leaves um, or burning dead plant material, um, I think I see a lot more people saying rarely or never. I, I think that was a common response um, earlier in the webinar, but I, I think there's more people that have responded to that mm -hmm. um, that way this time. So awesome. Thank you. I think I think we did see a little bit of change of perspective. Again, there's no right answer or no wrong answer, um, but definitely providing those benefits to your pollinators, your wildlife, um, your soil quality, water quality, air quality all things to consider when you're doing your fall um, outdoor yard chores. Okay, so we have one more poll question and I have never done this before in Zoom. So we're gonna pop it up and it's gonna be a short answer question to uh, ask you to share one word um, for your reaction to um, basically everything that you've learned here today, learning about fall chores and how they benefit pollinators, depending on what you choose to do. So um, if you can provide one word and um, I'm going to see how this pops up on my end and hopefully I'll be able to share um, the results with people. Um, so let's see what happens. So one, your one word reaction to what you've learned today. I see, I see people putting in input. That's great. We'll give you a little bit of time. Sometimes it's hard to narrow it down to one word. <laughs> All right, just a few more seconds.
And uh, all right, we're, we're going to go ahead and end it. And let me see what kind of results I can see, if any. And yeah. um, I don't know. I don't. I don't see. I didn't see anything on my end. <laughs> I didn't either. And sometimes, whenever the results come back, we might not be able to see them until the Zoom is over. Oh, okay. So this is what I was worried about. This is kind of a new, a new question type for for us who are putting this on. So we we might only get to see the responses afterwards, in which case um, everybody's going to get an email and we'll, we can share the results then, hopefully. So I'll go ahead and, and stop sharing and we're going to move on to the Q&A session because um, I think that's going to be really interesting for everybody. We've got some unanswered questions. So um, real quick, I am going to share my screen and just do a little bit of a wrap up. Okay, so um, hopefully everybody can see. Oh, oh wait, I gotta press share. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so um, thank you all. Before we do the Q and A, um, absolutely uh, very excited to have everybody here to hear the, our wonderful presenters. And um, Forest Her NC is is an organization with multiple different uh, government agencies and other other uh, partner agencies that are teaching people especially women landowners on how to manage their land. Um, so if you're not already connected with us, we would love to see you um, on our Facebook group. Um, look for Forest Her NC on Facebook. We have an Instagram. Um, you can always email us at forestherNC at gmail.com or go to our website, forestherNC.org, which has information about all the webinars that have been recorded. So you can go and view past webinars. Um, upcoming events. I think we're done with our events for 2023, but stay tuned because we'll have a whole new set of wonderful events happening next year in 2024. And finally, thank you all. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, as we go into the Q&A, please put any questions you have into the Q&A portion. Um, try to avoid the chat because it gets a little bit more jumbled and it's hard to keep track and we don't want to miss anybody's input. Um, but if you just want to like make a comment, you can put something into the chat. And um, also in the chat, I'm going to put in a link for our evaluation survey. Of course, our priority is creating and sharing content that's relevant and interesting to you. And the best way that we can learn what topics are interesting to you is if we get your feedback. So please um, follow this link that I'm going to share just, just now or in a second and um, uh, fill out the survey and let us know what you thought. Let us know, um, you know where, where you stand and what you want to see in the future from Forest Herd. So without further ado, I am so, going so to- So Fallon, yeah. I have the word cloud from the oh. uh, last question. So I'll share my sc screen. Okay, go ahead. Uh huh. Oh, so Bob, Bob is a is a genius. He's a Zoom genius, and we're very very happy that that he continues to be part of Forest Her. So that that's awesome. We've got interesting, excited uh, rest. That's beneficial. We all we all need more free time, don't we? <laughs> and enlightening. Perfect. I, I love those responses. Um, Thank you guys so much. And thank you, Bob, for putting that together. I have no idea how, how you did that, but that's amazing. <laughs> um, okay, so let's let's see what, what questions. Oh, great. And Bob just put the uh um the survey link into the chat and you will get an email. All the participants will get an email after this. Um, and you'll have an opportunity to fill out the survey then. But um what do we have in terms of Questions. We've got Caroline Ray. I know she put in this question, um, I think, pretty early on in, in Amanda's talk. So she asked, what types of plants can you grow for pollinators if you have mostly shade? And Barbara, if you've got some magical ones, feel free to, to pop in here as well. Um, the first one that popped into my mind, so we were talking about um, the asters, the sympatricians. There is a great wood, the woodland sympatricium. Um, some Pitrichium divericatus. Sometimes they call it the woodland aster. I have seen that flower in almost full shade um, or dappled sunlight in, in an understory. Um, 
and that's a really that's a great plant um, and it spreads it doesn't spread aggressively um, it spreads kind of pleasantly um, I have a part sun part shade garden and shade is there's gradients of shade so um, I, I've had actually decent luck with some of my um, golden rods as well um, there's one called goldenrod caesia c-a-e-s-i-a um, the common name that I've heard for it is called the golden fleece aster or golden fleece goldenrod um, and that will grow in part shade um, there was a really nice patch of it that I've seen that the whole area that it grows in gets almost completely full shade but it kind of gets this indirect light from an open area but it flowered its head off happily um, and um, also uh, goldenrod fireworks will also grow in part shade um, so I hope that's that's my three top like great flowering flower power um, pollinators and those are fall flowers there are some um, uh, tooth warts dentaria and Alan what's the other Den dentaria and cardamony uh, those are um, really great woodland um, perennials that only flower they flower for two weeks in March and April depending on where you're at um, full shade and um, really they they flower almost too early for like a big pollinator impact but they are very impactful for um, some of our smaller woodland bees um, Thank you. And um, Amanda, I can, and um, and Caroline, I can definitely attest personally, I have that, um, I know the common name, um, zigzag goldenrod, I believe, yes. um, or, or wreath goldenrod, I've heard it called wreath goldenrod, um, that Soledago uh, cesia is, is how I've always pronounced okay. it. And I have it planted in my front yard and my backyard. It's been blooming like crazy. And it's also one of the golden rods that is well behaved. So mm -hmm. it stays where you put it. It doesn't take over everything. And um, planted in clumps, it really, really looks gorgeous and attracts tons of pollinators. So firsthand experience, it's definitely an awesome one. Uh, yeah, I would concur with that. I have it in my front yard also. Uh, the, the It's C-A-E-S-I-A, -S mm -hmm. C-A-E-S-I-A. It's really good. Um, and I forgot to mention on our new hub, Audubon.org, on our website, we actually have a list of plants. If you're in the Piedmont region, uh, which covers all of the blooming times, um, and uh, you can download the spreadsheet if you're interested. Uh, but there's also information on the extension, um, the North Carolina extension meeting about um, things that will bloom in the shade. We have a lot of dry shade. It's it's not just shade, it's always dry shade too, right? <laughs> yep. I love those trees. <laughs> it's less dry though if you leave your leaves. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that the water holding capacity of those leaves, not necessarily getting boggy, but but holding soil moisture, which is really, really important, important for soil health. Mm -hmm. Um all right, let's let's see. We have a, an anonymous participant who asked, are there plants that we can plant now for the winter season for um, blooming or flowering? So presumably that look really, really nice in the winter time um, that also provide uh, texture and are good for animals. Oh, I would say that's really tough. Um, most of our flowers <laughs> sort of end blooming by the end of October, early November. Um, trying to think of anything um, and I'm not coming up with anything. We have some early spring bloomers mm -hmm. um, like uh, the Zizia is an early spring bloomer and then we have our spring ephemerals and things like that that'll start blooming in February. Um, mm -hmm. So that kind of brings you out of your winter doldrums and makes you happy <laughs> to, to go out in the woods and see a lot of the small things that you might not notice otherwise that are there for those uh, pollinators early in the spring. Because uh, I, I think we forgot to mention that, you know, pollinators, um, butterflies have different, they're not out all season. So they, some of them only emer emerge during the spring, the same with bees. So they may have a very short life, life um, time during the spring and then not be seen the rest of the year. So you need to have things flowering 
all the way from February to late October to help with our, all of our different pollinators. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's and a great I point. I, I guess uh, with, with the winter time, you're not gonna see a lot of flowers necessarily, at least not pollinator attracting flowers mm -hmm. because the pollinators are dormant during the winter time. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe veering a little bit away from pollinator plants, but thinking a little bit more of uh, plants that might benefit birds, um, certainly shrubs that produce mm -hmm. berries over the winter time, like some of our native hollies can provide um, wonderful foraging and, and habitat for other animals during the winter time. And also, especially our native um, uh, native hollies like um, Ilex verticillata, our, our winterberry holly that has just gorgeous, gorgeous berries um, over the winter time with everything else is brown. Um, and then beautyberry. Beautyberry has those bright magenta flowers that stick around for, for a little while and have great, um, uh, they're very nutritious for birds. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so planting for the winter season, yeah, some of the, some of the symphotricheums, like I said, would be, um, would be, great um for that because i i have one i have i have symphotrichium dumosus which i didn't include in my presentation it will not flower until mid-november it is still buds are super tight um i had it flowering last year at christmas and really the only thing that was visiting it at that time on a warm day you know we get those kind of warmish days um really at that time of year there are some honeybees that might be flying around so obviously honeybees aren't native they are livestock and they're flying around whenever the beekeepers let them go. Um, some of the smaller flies, we do have flies that will um, sometimes have year round habits. Um, but yeah, mainly flies and honeybees is really what you're going to see that time of year. I think it's, I loved how you, um, Erica, I love how you asked about, um, you know, texture or sorry, um, uh, you know, what, uh, what type of anonymous, I, how many, like the texture and for use by animals, anytime you can leave stems and have some structure, um, you're going to have habitat for something to live there. And so I usually use the verbiage of like, even if it's not flowering, it's still habitat for something. Um, and there are some things that have really great textures like um, bee balms. If you leave the little seed heads on the bee balms, I, I took a picture out, but some of them will like hold little caps of snow, which is really cute. Um, so it looks like these little like pom poms of snow <laughs> if we ever get any snow. Um, so yeah. I, I feel like that's one of the benefits that you get if you can sort of like withhold your desire to clean up the garden and just leave everything. And and if you can kind of get over the idea that what is there to look at is is dry and dead and see it for the texture that it does bring, um, leaving all those stems, leaving leaving that foliage. Um, if you if you pay attention and you go out and walk into the garden in winter time, the variety of of shapes and textures just from that dead plant material can provide winter interest that can be fascinating to look at. It, it mm -hmm. might not be super gorgeous from like far away, from like across the street, but if you're actually walking in it, you can see like the dried flower heads and the the different um, different widths and textures of of the grasses and things like that can just provide a lot of visual variety and appeal, even if the, the color scheme is a bit muted. <laughs> mm -hmm. I like that muted color scheme. Mm -hmm. um, Mary, Mary put into the Q&A um, asking about witch hazel for winter bloom, which is an excellent um, uh, thing to bring up. That's a native uh, species, at least our uh, Hemamelis virginiana is a native um, witch hazel that does bloom in really, really early spring. So that I, th I believe it's it's a spring bloomer, right? Or I've seen it flowering in January and February. So there you go. That's a that's a great one that will actually produce flowers. Um, and it, I think it has some some medicinal use. I think the the uh, it's astringent the the uh, not nectar the uh, the sap um, that can be used for, to uh, sanitize things. Mm -hmm. um, so Erica has got a question here. Are there any plants that will control small flowered? agrimony and other noxious invasives that would be safe or useful for a two horse field? Mm -hmm. This is, that's a great question. And um, I would recommend reaching out to your local cooperative extension office. 
Um, and if you have reached out to your cooperative extension office and haven't gotten an answer, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, so going into, and, and we have a lot of landowners here um, who may not be, who may have gardens, but also may have large acreages or properties or have farms and, and livestock. Um, we have a great forages research team at NC State and, a, and we have resources to help you manage grasslands and forage um, for livestock and including horses. And it's a different type of management when you're managing uh, enlarged acreage um, parcels. Um, and I'm sure that there is, um, but I definitely would recommend reaching out to your local cooperative extension office because they would be able to give you regionally specific recommendations for your for your issue because um, forages are definitely regionally um, specific as well. All the great things that cooperative extension can do. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, let's see. I don't I don't see any more questions. We have a little bit more time. We can stick around until three before we close out the meeting. So um, any questions or comments, uh, feel free to put them in, in the, the questions in the Q&A. Um, I guess comments can be in the chat. Uh, there's been a lot of conversation in the chat about different species that people have experience with. Somebody mentioned um, beggar's ticks, um, which I know as Bidens, but um, Amanda called Desmodium. So that's the problem with common names. <laughs> but right. um, there's there's just once you start delving into the variety of different species that that are native that, you know, might be roadside weeds, but if you pay attention to them can be extremely beautiful and provide a lot of wonderful benefits in your own yard, um, depending on what you have. So, you know, if you've, if we've talked about aggressive species or species that can kind of take over, if you have a huge piece of property, that might be perfect um, because it, it can really spread and provide habitat and um, benefits for over a large area, but maybe in your backyard, if you have a smaller space, you probably don't want to put um, really aggressive plants because they can really choke everything else out. So it depends on where you're planting and what your priorities are. Yeah, I I was on a client uh, site visit yesterday, and um, and they're they they they're brave. They've picked out an area where they're not going to mow, and they haven't mowed the area for a year. And they were asking me last night, like what else do we need to do? You know, do we need to treat it or do we need to do anything? I'm like, no, you know, it's great that you're not mowing it, you know, try and mow it maybe once a year. Um, I even recommended, and this was a recommendation that um, uh, Dr. Annabelle Renwick at Duke, um, Duke Gardens, she's the curator at of the Blomquist Native Plant Garden. And she's been managing the, um, the Piedmont Prairie there for the last six years. And she found out that in their first year, um, they had, uh, they burned after their second or third year, and they ended up with this almost monoculture of like two or three species, I guess it wouldn't be a monoculture, but it was just, they had planted almost 300 species and ended up with three after burning because of what fire does, fire is a disruptor. And so a lot of these species didn't need fire, especially in that short amount of time from being established. So what they did is instead of burning it, what they've done now is they actually go in and they mow once a year. They do a second mowing in May, and then they do a third mowing, but they only do it randomly throughout their patch to emulate buffalo moving through and, and bedding down in this area. And really what, I mean, by mowing or weed whacking at these different times, those all those like kind of random things that happen in nature all of them have these kind of like little idiosyncrasy things that that makes them do other things and so it favors some plants over others so I just said hey you know go you know try a little bit of random mowing and then just observe plants definitely make sure you're weeding out any invasives you know um, ligustrum is <laughs> ligustrum sinensis the Chinese privet's the worst so always pull that one up whenever you see it in any trees. If you're trying to maintain a grassland, you should always remove any tree species, even if they're natives. Um, 
but the serendipity of nature, seeds will fly in on the wind, birds will drop them, a deer will carry them through on their fur, you know, so you just always want to be watching and cultivating those things that find that spot really beneficial to their life cycle. Yeah, I actually find the winter a very good time to look for invasive plants, as as Amanda said. Um, <laughs> if you see something coming up that has shiny green leaves, small green leaves, it's probably invasive. It's probably some type of privet or English ivy or all these things that come when birds eat uh, berries from uh, uh, other, other uh, plants and drop them in your yard. So I walk my property in the winter um, to check for uh, invasive things coming up before they get too big so I can pull them up when they're really small little sprigs. And um, I think that's a good habit to get into. Um. Definitely. That's a great point. I, I love looking for privet in the wintertime because it's one of the few things that is evergreen and you can see it. You can see it much easier in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm actually thinking of the list of invasives that are evergreen that pop out in the winter. You've got the Chinese ligustrum, the Japanese ligustrum, your English ivy. Um, yeah, there's it's just a ton of stuff. So that's an excellent, excellent point if somebody's worried about um, invasive Pretty much everything control. on the shun list shows up in the winter as green. And the most yeah. people, they're saying, do you think it's this is invasive? I said, if it's green in the winter, the chances are that it is probably an invasive plant. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Not always, but, but the chances are, are higher, <laughs> much higher. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we do have a question from Caroline asking, um, and this is a, this is a great question. Um, is there a list of aggressive natives <laughs> somewhere? <laughs> oh, that's a great question. Um, use the word assertive. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> that's a good one. Um, not really. Um, because, you know, all of there's a gradient, right, of well-behaved, aggressive, um, obedient, or, um, you know, whatever you want to call them. But, um, you know, a lot of times you'll have to read the descriptions of those plants, and you really want to make sure that you're reading the descriptions of plants that are written by discerning gardeners, because you want that person to give you an honest answer about that plant. And, um Barbara, you mentioned this, but the, the um, plant toolbox at NC State, if you just Google NCSU plant toolbox, um, the extension gardener folks have been working very diligently on cultivating a library of plant profiles that are specific to North Carolina and our growing conditions. Um, there's the Lady Bird, Wild Johnson, Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center in Texas and the Missouri Botanical Garden um, has a really great website, but Missouri is in Missouri, and um, and the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center is in Texas, and they're going to be writing their cultivation descriptions based on those growing um, conditions. So I would highly recommend checking out the plant toolbox, um, and those are written by um, uh, either extension professionals, extension master gardener volunteers, um, and there are and it's written in in human language, not necessarily, you know, scientist gardener language. So, I, also, I also recommend the North Carolina Botanical Gardens, um, which is a, a wonderful state resource. It's a conservation botanical gardens, but on their website, they have list of plants. Someone's asking about shade. They have list for dry shade, for wet shade, for anything. So, you know, they have broken those up into different categories. If you're looking for specific kinds of native plants, mm -hmm. um, that that's a good resource also. Um, but, you know, talking about assertive plants, I actually like assertive plants when I'm starting out in a pollinator garden, like <laughs> mountain mint will spread, you know, certain species of mountain mint and I was working um, with a church, a local church on a pollinator bed, and they had enough funds to do about a third of the bed. So we did about a third of the bed with some mountain mint, some golden rods, cone flowers and things, and it was full sun. And then the next year we split about 50% of all of those and planted the rest and then used that to plant the rest this spring or this fall. So, um, 
you know, sometimes those assertive plants are really good, especially if you have places that you want to put plants or you want to give plants to neighbors or, you know, that sort of thing. It's, it's good to have those plants that are doing well. Um, That's a good point. And, and we get, you know, when you go to a garden center, I, I feel like a lot of people, you know, a garden center is there to sell you something and, um, which is great that you want to go to a place that has good plant material, but you also have to remember that those plants are going to grow. And even if it looks like, like I said, um, with our planting project out here, I had little four inch pots, like that's a very small pot. Um, and they tripled, sometimes quadrupled in size in one year. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so a lot of those plants will double, triple, quadruple in size, especially if you have a really well-rooted plant um, or you've got really nice garden soil. Um, you know, so a, a lot of that kind of aggressiveness can also be tapered with different nutrient availabilities and different types of soil and also watering regimes. If you don't water as often, most things will just be a little bit slower in growing than if you had irrigation running every week or every day. Yeah, I, we have done a lot of yard visits where we've gone to people's houses and they've planted. Um, I think that's great advice to look, look at the label and see how big that plant's going to be. Because we've been to places where they had like three shrubs, like one foot from each other. And we're like, these are going to get really big. You, you, you need to replant these a little bit further apart so that they have that room to grow. And, and that's true of a lot of, of, of our plants, especially a lot of the grasses will get to be you know, any pink nanthemum, you need to, you need to have at least three foot for that switch grass, because it's going to be a big grass. And otherwise, it's not going to have the room that it needs to grow. Right. Mm -hmm. Plant the right, right plant in the right place. Right. right? <laughs> and the plant yeah, description, yeah. Um, <laughs> when, when they, they need to provide you one, if you go to a garden center, and it just says like, like fall plant or, and it doesn't provide very much information, be very suspicious, because yes. they're probably hiding something from you. <laughs> True. Um, very true. So um, let's see, Erica's got another question about, uh, I think, seed supplies um, or seed suppliers. Uh, mm -hmm. The question is, is there a source for native high variety pollinator focused seeds for acres broadcasting? So large, large quantities. And I, I know at least some people know the answer here. Uh, I know that Mellow Marsh uh, actually has a number of different, and that's a grower who grows locally. So, you know, it's all local plants, which is one thing that's good if you want to get your seeds that are adapted to our area. Um, they're in uh, around Pittsburgh. They're, they're out there in Siler City. Siler City, yeah, somewhere down there. <laughs> but but um, they have a number of different seeds, seed mixes that you can purchase. And it's good to go online and look at, at what you can see what they have mixes of uh, grass and, and um, flowers and uh, different percentages and things like that. Or you can create your own mix. So that's that's a good place that I know in the state for ordering seeds. There are a couple of places online that produce, but they're not they're not in North Carolina. Amanda, you may know somebody else. There, there is Garrett Seed, which yeah. is um, southwest or southeast of Raleigh. They're in Four Oaks, Benson, that area of the world, kind of Sampson County, Johnston County area. Um, and uh, they provide um, pollinator mixes for large acreages. Their, their seed prices for eight for, um, per acre are pretty competitive. Um, there are two other major nation nationwide companies that I know the North Carolina Botanical Gardens works with. Um, Roundstone Seed um, is based in Tennessee or Kentucky, one of those states. Um, they, uh, they have many different pollinator mixes um, and they, uh, they even do have some Southeast mixes, which you do wanna look at where those seed companies are sourcing their specific species seeds from. Um, I, unfortunately it's really there is a nationwide shortage of native seeds it's actually been a nationwide recognized issue for conservation um, and there are mechanisms like the north carolina botanical gardens and 
I know you guys at the Wildlife Resources Commission are working with folks and landowners to collect seeds. Um, the North Carolina Forestry Service is working with folks to collect seeds. It's just very time consuming to do. Um, so the, the, the supply chain's not there, <laughs> um, but they're working on it. And um, so Roundstone and then Ernst Seeds, they're based out of the mid-Atlantic region, I think Pennsylvania or something, but they tend to have a lot more northeastern, midwestern seed sources. So just be very discerning. And then, and then, this is the most important part, I think, is if you are going to, if you're going to be planting for pollinators, you need to make sure that the seed mixes that you're getting have the variety, the nativity that you're looking for because there are some pollinator seed mixes that include non-native European or Asian species in them um, that look beautiful and give you that big bang for your buck but are not necessarily native to the southeastern United States. So whenever you getting whenever you select whatever seed mix that you're going for, make sure that that it is a native seed mix. Um, that that's my that's my recommendation now you can choose to have non-natives, but just know that it's not always a given that it's only going to be a native mix in a pollinator seed mix. Absolutely. And uh, well, I, uh, it, it is, it's 301 now. We had a great conversation. I have, I, I would go on all day talking about this stuff if we had the time, <laughs> but to respect all the participants uh, time and schedules, I think we need to, to wrap it up and Thank, thank you all once again so much for uh, joining us. And this will be posted on the Forest Her and C website at a, a certain point later. So, um, you know, if you know somebody who missed out, they can they can view it later. So thank you all. Have a great afternoon. Thank you so much.